Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bronwyn Edwards. I'm the CEO of Roses in the Ocean, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, thanks so much for joining us. We are um, here for the first event of our 12 month lived experience professional development series. And the webinar today is um, the title is considering the impacts of pathologizing suicidal thoughts and attempts through a social justice lens. Uh, it's, uh, it is a topic that I think um, has actually um, developed quite a lot of interest. We've got a lot of people who've registered to join us today. So I'm really looking forward to um, listening to our wonderful presenters very soon. I would like, first of all, though, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the lands on which we're meeting today and um, to pay our respects to their elders past and present and to their emerging voices. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge everybody who's joined us today uh, who has a lived experience of suicide and of course within our broader communities wherever you are. Um, we, we remember um, and pay honour to all the magnificent lives that have been lost to suicide across our country, to those people who live with suicidal thoughts um, regularly, um, people who've made attempts and, uh, and to those people who care for friends and loved ones. We also um, acknowledge the incredible impact that suicide has on everybody um, and I'm sure on everyone who's tuned in here today. So thank you so much for being with us. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you your presenters for today. Um, we have Martina McGrath. Martina, um, you can give a little wave. <laughs> Martina is part of the Roses in the Ocean team. Martina heads up research and evaluation for Roses in the Ocean, both internally and externally. She's also um, uh, looks after our inclusive, um, sorry, inclusion, diversity and equity right across the organisation. Martina is an early career researcher for the International Association of Suicide Prevention for their special interest group um, around lived experience. Uh, and she's in the very early stages of her PhD, which is, um, which is wonderful. I'd also love to introduce you to you, Carrie Lumby. Um, now, Carrie is um, an executive member of the Illawarra Shoalhaven Suicide Prevention Collaborative. She's also the lived experience member on the Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District uh, Towards Zero Suicide Steering Group. These titles are so long. <laughs> um, Carrie's also a co-founder of a peer support group for people who experience um, suicidal, um, suicidality, suicidal distress, uh, and um, that's a peer-led group called Shelter. So it's wonderful to have you both with us. I'm really, really looking forward to this presentation and I'm going to now leave you um, in the very safe hands of Martina and Carrie and I'll come back at the end of the webinar, um, hopefully if we've got some time to answer some questions that may come through uh, the next 45 minutes. Okay, thank you, over to you. Apologies. Um, I'll say that again. Thank you very much to Bronnie for, for such a, a wonderful welcome. It is, it is a, um, a very special and a great time to be kicking off a 12 month program, a very new program of professional development for people with lived experience of suicide and many other people who are, who are tuning in. So we thank you very much for your interest. So, um, so I'd just like to just briefly take you through the webinar content. So today we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about challenging the biomedical model. We're also going to look at um, the role of trauma and the role it plays in mental and emotional distress. We'll then have a look at um, taking compassionate approaches to understanding mental distress. We'll also then touch on well, what does this mean in terms of creating a culturally safe environment. And then we'll move on and, and kind of with, with that as the groundwork, look at why language matters. So we'll give some context to that discussion. And we'll move on and then look at how, how we can, all of us take a trauma approach, informed approach and be, just have a culturally competent mindset. And as Bronnie mentioned at the end, we'll, we'll have time for a, a question and answer session. 
And just before we kick off into the first topic, I just wanted to touch on self-care while you're on, on, the, on the line with us today. So please look after yourself. And if you feel like you need to do, take a break, please do so. Um, we'd ask that you just be mindful, of course, about the language you use, and particularly if you're in the chat box, asking questions just to, to use safe language. And if you need to, please reach out to someone if you feel you, you need to have a chat with someone. And on the bottom right, you can see a picture of uh, Rose in the Ocean Wellbeing Wi-Fi. And it's a nice reminder just to remember to tap into those particular domains of your being. So um, yeah, so take care of yourself and I hope you really enjoy the webinar. And now I'll hand over to, to Carrie. Thanks, Martina. Just a, 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 some qualifiers before we begin. When we're talking about mental distress in this context, it, it does encompass thoughts of suicide and, and therefore sometimes that leads to attempts. So when we're talking about mental distress, we don't always um, say um, particularly that we're talking about people who have suicidal thoughts and um, attempts, but that's what um, this is all about. So um, also we're not claiming to be academic experts and we're not claiming that there's only one way to um, understand mental ill health or that trauma explains everything. And we're certainly not um, anti-psychiatry or anti-medication. We just believe in a person's individual choice. So um, we've included a reference and resource list that will be available on the ROSES website soon for people who are curious to know more about the evidence base that we touch on for the biomedical model versus trauma-informed approaches. Um, so we're just gonna look briefly at um, the biomedical model and challenges to it, recent sort of critiques of it. So with innovations in medical science in the second half of the 20th century, the biomedical model of mental disorders as they're known, which is also known as the medical model or the clinical model or the illness model, um, emerged um, and has come to really dominate our understanding of mental health issues. The biomedical model sees various forms of mental health conditions as symptoms of an underlying chemical imbalance or, or brain disease. And this of course leads to the idea that drug treatment will correct these chemical imbalances. The dominance of this model has resulted in an explosion of rates of psychiatric diagnoses and, and medication prescribing rates, particularly increasingly in children and young people. Um, more recently, as I, I said, the medicalization of mental and emotional distress has been criticized both from outside and importantly within the, the psychiatric and, and clinical professions. And the key reasons here, and, and as I said, we'll be providing resources and, and academic references, so we're just touching on these at a high level, is that there is a lack of good scientific evidence for the basis of this diagnostic criteria and therefore um, of the basis of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that's become essentially the Bible of how to diagnose and treat people. There's a lack of evidence for the positive outcomes of diagnosis and treatment versus other treatments. Um, or even um, accounting for the simply self-limiting nature of some mental health conditions. And there's now overwhelming evidence for the sometimes devastating impacts um, of biomedical psychiatric treatment. For example, long-term antipsychotic use um, reduces life expectancy of somewhere between 15 and 25 years, between about 25 and 47% of people subject to involuntary treatment develop post-traumatic stress disorder as a direct result of this experience. Um, and also we just know that a reductive approach to mental and emotional distress strips it of social and cultural context and, and the uniquely rich lived experience of an individual person's life. And um, I think it's interesting to look at this quote from Dr. Alan Francis that he says, DSM definitions do not include personal and contextual factors such as whether the depressive symptoms are an understandable response to loss, a terrible life situation, psychological conflict or personality factors. And importantly, Dr. Francis was the chair of the task force for the, revis the fourth revision of DSM-5. So uh, someone that is an undeniable authority of that, um, his um, book, Saving Normal is something that I'd recommend if people are curious about, have, have a look and we'll leave that in a reference list. He also has said that it's the easiest thing in the world to give a diagnosis and to write a pill prescription. It's the hardest thing in the world often to get rid of a diagnosis once it's been established. A wrong diagnosis made in 10 minutes can haunt for life. A medication given casually can do great harm, very little good. So this is a serious moment in a person's life. 
Um, and of course, there's also increasing evidence uh, for the emerging, um, emerging now for the role of trauma in chronic mental health and emotional distress, and particularly in the rising risk of suicide in those people, and a general move, as we know, in, in our culture to, to just treating people and viewing people more holistically. And that's what's known as the biopsychosocial ap ap approach within sort of clinical professions, particularly um, in social work. So this increased awareness of the role of trauma has actually led to a whole body of scientific research on the neurobiological aspects of both acute and cumulative trauma, particularly developmental trauma from childhood and how it literally rewires the brain and sets up people for inc inc radically increased risk of mental and physical ill health and a real radical increase in risk of suicide. It's also led to large scale longitudinal studies on the impacts of childhood trauma, that developmental trauma, on the physical and mental health of, of adults and the rising risk again of suicide. Um, and um, the seminal study here is the ACES study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and Martina will speak a bit about that now. Thanks, Martina. Thanks, Carrie. So yes, yeah, so um, what, we're, what we're going to move on to now is just talk a little bit about the role of trauma in, in mental distress. Um, and this quote at the top of your screen is from the Blue Knot Foundation. Um, and it says, you know, stress is really a state of high arousal. It's a coping mechanism. It's feeling overwhelmed, a survival response. So you've probably heard the terms fight, flight and freeze. And it's activated by a perception of experience of threat. Um, and initially, it's initially protective yeah, fundamentally. Um, and so, as Carrie just mentioned, you know, there, there has been this seminal study which, which had over 17,500 uh, participants over a 15 year period. Um, and what I want to do is really just um, for the next couple of minutes talk about the different types of trauma, and they are situational trauma. So, this can be one particular exposure, such as, you know, there can be war, for example. Um, and and then, you know, car crashes and, and plane crashes are another example. Then there's de developmental trauma, which is, as Carrie has mentioned, is linked to, to childhood trauma. And we'll also, you know, talk a bit about inter intergenerational trauma, which can include in individual and cultural trauma. And we'll, we'll also look at, you know, systemic trauma in terms of what is that and, and um, what role does that play? and just touch on briefly a bit more about the, the ACES study and it talks about toxic stress and what that means. So as I said, you know, um, situational trauma can include one single event or maybe multiple events, um, whereas developmental trauma is generally linked to, to childhood trauma. And so I'd get you, to, get you to pause and just think about, you know, what kinds of trauma do you think this might effect in terms of priority populations, for example. So just start thinking through this, these things for yourself. Um, and then when we look at um, intergenerational trauma, you know, you can think of um, priority populations um, as well. And in terms of systemic trauma, think of, we, we can think about things such as discrimination, the role that this plays in terms of discrimination and disempowerment and how it actually then feeds into what we call, you know, dominant power structures to people who are already quite, quite marginalised and, and disenfranchised. And some of those groups, you know, we, we know are um, people like from LGBTI populations, Indigenous and cool communities, um, but also anyone, any groups of people who are perhaps socially and or economically disadvantaged. Um, including, you know, refugees, young people, quite frankly, um, older people, people with varying abilities, for example. And then when we look at, you know, systemic, systemic trauma, we can think about the role that, that systems play in, in either re-traumatising or causing, causing the trauma to, these, to, to people who already have, a, have an experience of, of trauma. Um, and this, in terms of the mental health systems, you know, you think about things such as um, forced treatment, for example, um, and forced containment, and this can include, in Queensland we call it involuntary treatment orders, um, which can include medication and, and being restrained, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but also in, in systemic trauma, we can think about other institutions, I guess we could call them, such as religious institutions, for example, um, and even the justice system, which can, can again uh, re-traumatise people who are already, you know, traumatised from previous experiences. And again, it's, you know, things like police and juvenile systems, justice systems, again. And it, it's important to note, depending on how early the trauma has, has occurred, it can definitely result in development of um, what we call either two kinds of brain. So that is a survival type brain or a learning type brain. And a survival type brain is a brain that is one that's, that's developed uh, due to developmental trauma happening quite early. And it's, it's one that where the brain is always alert to danger um, rather than rather than a brain that is um, that is a learning brain. In other words, it's open and, and, and not constantly in fear, basically. And so I'm, I, I get you just to pause again and think about in terms of those two types of brain. What does that mean for people with lived experience of suicide? Depending on whether someone has developed what's called a survival brain, which is a brain that's always living in in constant fear and ready for danger as opposed to a brain that's got what's called a learner's brain, which is, is completely open and, um, and learning and not in that highly distressed state all the time. So just something to reflect on there. As we talked about earlier, there's, there was this, um, this large study which has now been replicated in a number of countries called the ACE study, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, and it commenced in, in about 1985, but they then found some really startling, startling results. And so they decided to expand the study. Um, and, it, and the original study was conducted from, from, from 1997 to, for the next 15 years. And it, and it basically looked at, um, it looked at people who had trauma, and so it asked a, asked a series of questions related to adverse childhood experiences. And what it, what it found was there was a direct correlation between the higher the ACE score, so the number of adverse childhood experiences a person had, with their, their, their life outcomes in terms of chronic health issues, including physical issues and, of course, mental health issues. Um, and importantly, of course, in relation to lived experience of suicide, one of the findings from this study is, is that people who had, you know, ACE scores, and particularly those that were higher, were 12 more times more likely to have attempted suicide. There are a number of, um, I guess, um, stark findings. And one was the direct link between childhood trauma and the early onset of chronic diseases, which Carrie and I have both touched on previously. Um, and the other one, you know, is, is the correlation between adverse childhood experiences and, and alcoholism, for example, is one, one example. And I guess another third finding was around um, those who had those adverse childhood experiences and the correlation between mental health and social problems as an adult. And again, you know, this is just, I guess, um, really highlighting the role that tra trauma can play, play and how it impacts um, a person as they, as they develop and grow up. Um, and then finally, in the study also, they, they talked about um, this, this concept of toxic stress. And it really is this thing about cumulative trauma and the, and the effect that it has. And so the study sort of noted that children with high toxic stress, stress levels live their lives in this, this concept again of fight, flight or freeze mode. Um, and they respond to the world as if it's a place of danger. And as, as Robert Adner said, and he's one of the, the original architects of the original study said, we need to prevent adverse childhood experiences and at the same time, change our systems, including educational, criminal justice, healthcare and mental health public systems even workplaces so that we don't further traumatise people who are already traumatised from previous experiences. Okay, so 
on the, on, with that as a backdrop, we'll now just have a, have a quick look at, well, what is the impacts of all of that now that we know a little bit more about the role of, of um, the different types of trauma and particularly developmental trauma and childhood trauma and, and how that plays out. On the right hand side, you can see um, a wonderful diagram which depicts the impacts of childhood trauma. And, and this diagram is from the um, agency from Clinical in Innovation from New South Wales Health, which are actually quite leading the way in terms of their approach to understanding a trauma-informed approach, particularly around, around mental health. So if you're ever curious, um, check out New South Wales website and have a look. And so on, on, the, on the left, you can see that with, with this as a backdrop, you know, there's the reason with people with um, a history of trauma and, and what I call unresolved trauma have, have um, issues in terms of developing relationships and trust and, and just this overall feeling of being dis disempowered. Um, and that there can be physical effects, obviously, such as someone experiencing psychosis, disassociation, sleep disturbances, substance use, they can also appear to be, you know, at two ends of the spectrum, either um, appearing to be quite aggressive or the reverse is being quite passive in nature as a response to, to being traumatised. And again, if there's, there, there is systemic trauma that's um, traumatising someone or re-traumatising, there's an absolute reluctance to, to trust the people in these systems. And so, you know, when in healthcare systems, this can be seen as... Um, being non-compliant or whatever, we'll talk but more about that later, but there's actually uh, you know, some reason and rationale which does directly relate to the person's trauma experience first and foremost. So it's important to, to know that firstly. And, and now I'll hand over to, to Carrie. Thanks, Martina. So we wanted to sort of shift focus now to, not just in the space of some of these difficulties, but what, what does it mean to to move away from the biomedical model towards a trauma-informed, what we're calling a compassion-focused approach to mental and emotional distress. And, and just to give you a, a bit of background, the recovery movement that was um, founded by people with a lived experience of, of psychiatric treatment has, has really generated some of the most influential non-clinical compassion-focused approaches to understanding mental and emotional distress. And this was really born out of this human rights activism by people with a lived experience of some, the sometimes devastating and disempowering experiences of psychiatric treatment and the, the, the stigma and discrimination associated with this. So it's intrinsically a, a social justice movement. When people have been, I guess, disproportionately impacted by systemic inequalities, intergenerational trauma, and then exposure to forced treatment. So those sort of layers of compounding trauma that Martina was speaking about, um, and, and particularly on top of having unresolved trauma to then be traumatised by the treatment for that, um, it's, um, and for it to be pathologised, that, that really is fundamentally a human rights issue. And I guess the ultimate example, as Martina was alluding to before, in Australia is, is Abor Aboriginal people and the ongoing impacts of colonisation and really the cultural transmission of trauma and then um, the expression of unresolved trauma being pathologised and um, forced treatment being imposed. So the two approaches that um, have developed directly out of this recovery movement are the Hearing Voices Movement and Intentional Peer Support. And they, they hold very similar values and principles. So I'll just give you um, a, a fairly brief overview of both of these approaches. So um, the Hearing Voices Movement was started in 1987 by a Dutch psychiatrist, Marius Rom, and mental health advocate, Sandra Escher. And it really challenges the idea that the voice hearing experience and, and a, a whole range of unusual beliefs and experiences that we think of traditionally as psychosis, um, are, that, that they're necessarily a symptom of mental illness. It really appreciates the role of trauma in these experiences, particularly the very high rates of childhood trauma in people who are subsequently diagnosed with a psychotic illness. It sees the voice hearing experience as an inherently meaningful one. The development of voices and visions can be creative coping strategies for expressing unresolved trauma and are often metaphorical in nature, expressing something that the person may not have been able or were not, was not able to or not allowed to express in a literal way. Um, it's, it's a fundamentally recovery-oriented approach 
it's based on the idea that you don't have to be symptom free to live a meaningful life and that if people are treated with compassion and understanding and allowed to explore their experiences openly and free of a risk management response that this in itself reduces dist the distress often associated with these experiences and as a result can sometimes resolve symptoms if that's what a person is looking for. Um, again, it's ultimately a social justice movement because it seeks to reduce and eradicate really the stigma and discrimination that is associated with the diagnosis of a psychotic illness and, and extreme um, mental and emotional distress by empowering these people to understand their experiences in a way that's, that's meaningful for them and to find recovery. And then intentional peer support, which draws on some of the um, Hearing Voices movement is really just a framework for thinking about and developing peer-to-peer -peer relationships in the context mainly of um, formal peer work and it's really considered now the gold standard actually of peer support training. It was founded by Sherry Mead, a mental health consumer advocate in the early 90s and she identifies as being a psychiatric treatment survivor um, and as someone whose mental ill health was the result of unresolved trauma that wasn't ever explored but just was pathologized. Um, it sees peer relationships as equal partnerships where both parties learn and grow together rather than one person being the expert helper. It's inherently trauma-informed and recovery-oriented and encourages people to move towards the life that they want to live rather than focusing on them as a problem or trying to fix their symptoms. It, it also therefore has a social justice dimension. Not only is it about reducing stigma and discrimination, it's fundamentally about systems change. And, and really just um, at its broadest, it's about transforming human relationships to in, reduce the impact of power, to really call that out and to understand it. And um, just to encourage us to become curious about each other and um, different perspectives and, and the insights that they can bring. And importantly, I think um, it's um, very important to note that um, there are also um, uh, new sort of therapeutic modalities that, have, that are really coming out of mainstream psychology particularly, just to show that these are not sort of outlier approaches. They're not sort of radical approaches that um, meant people with lived experience of psychiatric diagnosis and treatment um, are um, taking, but they're actually now quite mainstream psychological pro pro approaches. And I'll just, um, we'll, we'll link to resources on the website um, about these. So I won't touch on them too, in too much depth here, but the Power Threat Meaning fr Framework was developed by a group of psychologists and mental health consumer activists as an alternative approach to understanding mental distress, particularly extreme mental distress um, to the traditional psychiatric model. It's developed with consideration to the impacts of power in people's lives and, and the kinds of threat systems, as, as Martina was explaining before, that, that the misuse and abuse of create, the power creates in people and, and just the ways people become habituated to respond to, to threat, as Martina was describing before. So it's also got a social justice dimension. It appreciates particularly the way systemic social issues lead to increased so emotional and mental distress and therefore troubling behaviour, particularly in some of the most disadvantaged people um, and the way in which that's then pathologized and people are re-traumatized by the treatment that is associated with that. ACT therapy, which people may be more familiar with, which is now sort of positive, posited as an alternative to CBT uh, therapy. It's just a form of psychotherapy that's gained quite a lot of currency recently. Its core value is really about compassionate attention to suffering rather than symptoms and to understand understanding mental and emotional distress is just a common human experience. It really emphasizes acceptance of our experiences rather than trying to, to fix them or to eradicate symptoms and um, emphasizes self-compassion for people as just being vulnerable humans, just like everyone else. So it's very normalizing in that way. Um, it employs mindfulness as a strategy for reducing distress. So, so is inherently an alternative kind of non-clinical approach open dialogue just for the, um, in the interests of, of time. Um, it's, um, I won't go into it, but it's, it was developed in Lapland in the 1980s, again, by psychologists looking, I guess, for a more effective way of treating acute mental distress, particularly psychosis. And that also takes this very curious approach to people's experiences, rather than this expert stance that traditional clinical approaches assumes. And um, I think what's really important is that we can think of this as a paradigm shift 
that's embodied in a shift in, in the background question to which we come to people. And that is the relevant question in psychiatry shouldn't be what's wrong with you, but what's happened to you. And that's by Eleanor Longdon, who's a central part of the Hearing Voices movement. And I'd highly recommend that people look at her TED talk. Um, I think it's called The Voices in My Head. It's, it's an excellent little digestible snapshot of what, what this whole movement is about. Um, so we might move on now to just having a quick look at what, what does this mean, this sort of um, paradigm shift in terms of um, creating a culturally safe environment when we're working with people with a lived experience of suicide that's also, that also have been ex have significant exposure to the mental health system. So we've sort of touched on a couple of theoretical frameworks um, including sort of a trauma-informed and recovery-oriented approach. And here's a table that sets out, we thought it might be helpful to set out these theoretical perspectives, including the social justice dimension here, which is rights-based. Um, and what this requires of us in practical terms when we're working with people. So as you can see, the, the conventional clinical system, it's very interesting, has started to adopt the language and, and um, the principles of the recovery movement. You now hear quite often in health systems, you see it in their policies, on their websites, they talk about trauma-informed care and recovery-oriented practice, which really demonstrates the way in which what's originally a social justice movement started by people with a lived experience can have such a profound influence on mainstream approaches to mental health treatment. Um, and um, as we've outlined, we're sort of just drawing together these various elements of what constitutes a socially just way to treat people who have had significant exposure to the mental health system. So rights-based, do we see there? So really promoting self-determination. It's recognising that people with a psychiatric diagnosis and, and exposure to, to treatment are highly likely to have experienced significant trauma and then including the trauma associated with, with um, particularly forced treatment. And this needs to be taken into account in every aspect um, of our approach to working with people. Also, um, where um, it's inherently, as we've said, trauma informed. So um, that just really recognises that people with a psychiatric diagnosis and, and, and significant treatment are highly likely to have experienced um, significant trauma, um, as I said, and um, it's strength based as well. So recognising that people with mental health issues are often very resilient. They're not just a, a passive set of symptoms to be risk managed, but they're often survivors in the, in the truest sense of that term. And, and also just um, recovery oriented. So that idea of focusing on the life a person wants to live, that people can and do recover and that recovery is an individual process determined by the person and their unique identities and life circumstances. And, and what we can do is to take an active role in walking alongside people through their recovery process and really be allies in this process. And so what does that look like for the person? What does that feel like um, to be treated that way? And it's when you take a rights-based perspective, the person feels empowered. When you take a trauma-informed approach to care, a person feels respected. When we take a, a strength-based approach, a person feels resilient. And when we are recovery-oriented in, in our approach, a person can feel hopeful. So obviously you can see this is all super important um, when working with people, um, particularly in terms of people with a lived experience of suicide. Um, so I think um, when we, we take account of all of that and, and um, what cultural safety means in this context, you can see that particularly it's about the, um, reducing the impacts of power. And so when we're working with people who have been systematically disempowered, and, and we've talked about this before, particularly when that's compounded um, by say systemic racism or other forms of cultural discrimination and oppression as Martina had spoken about, the, in terms of the impact of power, language really matters. And, and Martina will talk about that now. Thanks, Carrie. So yes, so, um, so we'll just have a, a bit of a chat now about, about why language matters and, and why it matters so deeply to people with experience of suicide and especially those who, who have a history of trauma, unresolved trauma. And I love this quote by Mary O'Hagan um, from her memoir, Madness Made Me. Made Me. Once I was labelled with mental illness, I was seen as a helpless bundle of needs without competence and rationality. I was handed over to the experts who colonised my story of suffering and condemned me to a predetermined pathway 
of recurring <clears throat> or deteriorating illness. Um, and so we, we want to acknowledge that, you know, um, the suicide prevention sector in particular has already been doing some work in terms of addressing the issue of language. And, and in fact, there's, there's, there's plenty of research out there to, to support this. So I've just brought up uh, on this, this slide, we've got a, a picture of the, um, which was developed by Mindframe from Every Mind uh, a number of years ago to, to really try and um, address stigmatizing language, particularly in the media. Um, and as you can see, we've got some examples of what's the issue with the particular language um, on, the, on the far left and in the middle, we've got why that's problematic. And then on the far right, you know, there's this, this, the preferred language that um, the sector has been trying to shift towards. And so there's, all, there's an acknowledgement, I guess, that's the, particularly in the suicide prevention sector, la language evolution has already been occurring. Um, and it's important to note, as Carrie and I have kind of already started to mention, that language can, is a, can be powerful. It can either be weaponised or it can, so it can harm or it can heal, depending on how it's used. Um, and as I mentioned, there's also a number of, number of um, academic papers, again, you, you know, there are references out there that talk about the, the link and the power of language, and particularly in terms of suicide prevention and stigmatising language. So I'd encourage you, if you're curious, to, to do some research of your own, and we will, we will put some of those, those links in the resources pack for those who are curious on our website. And so Carrie and I are just now going to, so with that as a background and, and acknowledging that the suicide prevention sector has already been doing great work in terms of um, addressing language and stigmatising language and how to keep moving forward, well, you know, what we acknowledge is that language is evolving and it should do. It should move with the times and the more we know, the more we do better and the more we try. And so this table here, Carrie and I are just going to um, chat with you about um, some, of the, some of the language that um, can be perceived as being disempowering and talk about well, what's, what's the converse of that? What is empowering language? And then why, why is, that, is that a problem? Um, and so I'll just um, briefly touch on, you know, there's a commonly used term in, in clinical set settings around assertive outreach. And, and you know, we'd argue that um, a better way of framing this is responsive out, outreach. And as it says on the far right, you know, the reason the word assertive has, is problematic is because it has, it has power over tones. And so immediately for those who have been traumatised and perhaps re-traumatised in systems, that word becomes problematic. Um, similarly, you know, there's a, another co common phrase that's used in a, a clinical phrase around people being non-compliant. Um, and you, you, this is, this is a, a rephrasing. We'd say, well, actually, they're not being non-compliant. They're actually declining, declining a service, wanting to explore other options. And again, the reason that that word is so problematic is again, it, it implies it's, it's related to power and it means that for you to be not complying, you're again giving up your own power. And for people who have already been disempowered, that's problematic. Yeah, and then also the term manipulative behaviour, which is often associated with particular diagnoses. So particularly, um, a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, which we know um, huge amounts of stigma and discrimination and particularly attached to that diagnosis. And it's um, e even that diagnosis, there's a shift and a reframing towards um, just calling that complex trauma or unresolved trauma. And um, a, a much more empowering way of talking about it or a strength-based way of talking about um, people's troubling behaviour is to just um, to talk about it as in terms of a person expressing unmet needs, um, particularly if someone's had experienced significant childhood trauma where their needs haven't been met and their voices have been shut down, uh, um, or extreme help-seeking behaviour is sometimes how it's put. And it's just really just um, acknowledging that a person's behaviour is often a response to their needs not yet being met. And of course, we can see that that is not um, appreciated in using terms like manipulative behaviour, which is very morally laden. And then also psychotic, that is a clinical 
term, but when people use it, lay people just say someone's psychotic. What they're really saying is that people are, people have unusual beliefs or experiences, um, which is a much more helpful way to think about it, or just experiences that other people typically don't. And, and that helps to really normalize the person's experience, um, particularly when they're experiencing extreme mental distress. And it challenges that, that stigmatizing language that we've talked about, that is often associated with people who are, are experiencing the, the most extreme and often chronic forms of mental distress. So it's a very helpful way of um, reducing distress in that person. And it's very, very powerful when we use sort of clinical language to try and other people. Um, it's, it's just uh, really compounds the discrimination and the stigma associated with certain diagnoses. Thanks, Karen. Um, and so what we'd like to just touch on now is, is, well, now that we know all of this and we've got some background, um, what does that mean in terms of de developing a trauma-informed and a culturally competent mindset? And I love this, um, this iceberg image on your right. And so it's really about appreciating um, what's actually going on for people beyond what you might see on the surface in terms of someone's response. And so what you might see is... Um, as a behaviour is people who are, who are angry or, or screaming and clenched fists, for example. But, but what's really happening underneath the surface is actually somebody who's, um, who's feeling deeply frustrated and hurt, embarrassed, um, depths of sadness and grief and worry and confusion. Um, and again, as we've, we've mentioned before, I think, you know, disempowered people will, will, will tend to behave in disempowered ways. Um, and there's a fear of also, you know, a crisis response and, and that the frustration comes from decades of advocacy with, with little, little movement and response to that. And so we'd encourage, you know, all of us, all of us just to, to look at what does it mean to be culturally confident in terms of working with people um, with a lived experience of suicide attempts, thoughts and those who have experiences of forced psychiatric treatment and trauma. Carrie, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I've gone blank here. My screen's gone blank, but I, I, as long as you can keep hearing me, yeah. in the in the end, what what we what this all boils down to, and I think this makes complete sense to people with a lived experience of suicide, working in suicide prevention advocacy, whether they have had exposure to the mental health system and and to psychiatric treatment or not. You see them people being such allies and champions of this non-clinical compassionate approach of appreciating people's strong emotions in this context, that it's really all about connecting to the common humanity of our lived experience and paying compassionate attention to distress, not diagnosis and to suffering rather than symptoms. Thanks, Carrie. That's, that's a nice that's a nice wrap. Um, we're actually now at the point um, where we're actually going to open up uh, for some questions and um, I think Bronnie's here to, to help us out with that and we're, we're willing to take some questions. Great, Martina, if you could maybe stop sharing the screen now, we'll come back to that group view, that'd be lovely. All right, thank you both so much. That was really interesting. Um, so I've just opened up the chat from here. If anybody has any um, questions for Martina or Carrie, we've got a few minutes. Um, so yes, just a question uh, in with regards to can you have access to these slides? Absolutely. Um, we will make sure that um, the slides and the resources that Carrie and Martina have referred to throughout their presentation are made available to everyone who's registered. Everyone's shy at the minute. So you've got any questions at all of, of any of the various topics that the ladies have spoken about? Please just pop that into your chat box, your Q&A, sorry. Just got a, a question in from somebody uh, with regards to um, 
if there is, and um, if any of you have a recommended uh, ACT therapist, so look, we'll, we'll have a look and see, and if we do, we'll um, come back to you directly. Question here from somebody asking, are you both saying that there's no such thing as a mental illness? Carrie, would you like to answer that first? No, certainly not. And um, as we'd said at the top of the presentation, um, and, and just, just wanting to reiterate that, uh, that we're, we're not saying that, we're saying that this is another way to, to understand, to conceptualise um, mental and emotional distress and that there is um, a significant body of research around this. So it's not um, just the perspective of people with lived experience, but I, I would really recommend, um, and it's certainly, I think this is also very important to empower people to, um, it's about ind the individual choice. For some people, it um, is very helpful to have a diagnosis. It's very helpful to have treatment. It's um, people also have positive outcomes for themselves, um, you know, in terms of medication. So certainly, absolutely not are we, say, are we anti psychiatry or saying that there's no such thing. What we're saying is that there's more than one way to understand and conceptualize and therefore um, more than one approach to understanding and also treating um, extreme mental and emotional distress. So I, I hope that answers the question, but certainly we will we'll be developing some resources that we'll get to get on the website soon. So I just really um, encourage people to to investigate this for themselves. And there's a lot of um, academic literature as, as well as sort of mainstream literature around this stuff. And, and I, I might just add too, if you, if you look at the person-centred approach, it's about what, what is, how does the person identify their experience? And, and as Carrie has said, for some it is, it is around the treatment they've had and good treatment they've had. And so if people identify it as being mental illness, that's fine. It's a person-centred approach to go with, with the language and, and the experiences, how they choose to identify. Lovely, thank you. Uh, a question here. Um, wonderful presentation, extremely interested in the survivor mind. Do you have any research I could access regarding this topic? Will that be something that you can put in the resources for people? I can, yep. Lovely. Um, a question in here. I'm curious about how to provide support and resources to help people understand their trauma history. From my experience, education was key. Oh gosh, that just disappeared on me then. Sorry, I've got to try and find the, um, as people are putting questions in, it's moving around. From my experience, education was key to start the healing process and, and articulating my needs of support services. So any, um, any comments from either of you about uh, how to provide support and resources to help people understand their trauma history? Yeah, for, for me, because I have personal experience with this, the light really switched on when I started to read some sort of fairly mainstream books, but they're, they're, that were evidence informed, but written in a more digestible way. And um, so it's, that's not for everyone. But yeah, I can I just share that, that my experience was read, it was uh, reading a couple of books, one um, called The Body Never Lies, another one called The Body Keeps the Score. And um, also Bruce Perry's work on particularly on developmental trauma. Um, but obviously um, people um, educate themselves in a variety of ways. So um, I, certainly um, I think it's a, a, a great um, issue that you raise and um, it, it makes me um, want to go and be a bit more curious about what resources are out there. But there are some great websites and Martina and I will go away today and, and link mm -hmm. to them where there's some very digestible resources, particularly um video resources, which I think um, have more broad appeal. Lovely, thank you. Um, thinking big picture and beyond the currently emerging safe spaces and safe haven cafes, which in brackets this person said are wonderful to see, are awesome to see, are there any practical changes you think can be made to improve the way services respond to people experiencing suicidal distress? What's next after safe spaces? What do we need to be advocating for? Wow. What's next after safe spaces? Um, for me, it's, 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 it's more places where people can go and feel welcomed and safe. And so, um, you know, that is beyond perhaps a, a health settings, for example. So it can be wherever that might be in a community. 
So I'd like to think that places like cafes and libraries can be places where people can go. I'm thinking Nirvana here, obviously, around, around the clock, I've seen some wonderful innovations around 24 hour libraries even, where people can go and, and, and drop in and, and just be safe and welcomed. And again, um, around not clinicalizing their experience, but just feeling welcome and safe and normalizing their experiences. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. I also um, believe that peer respites are a really important complement to um, safe spaces. So the um, safe spaces that have a residential component, they're entirely peer led. The Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Communities, AFIA House is really, for me, uh, one of the gold standards of that. And it, um, we could link to that resource as well. Um, there's some sweet little videos about the um, perspective of people with lived experience that have had the opportunity to stay in a peer respite. Also, like the shelter group that we've started in Wollongong, I'm a big believer in peer support groups. You mm. don't need government funding, you just need um, a willingness to share your lived experience. I think we've got to think as broadly as possible because ultimately what we want to create is a safe space for everyone. That's about um, the community being healthier and more humane as a whole. This is not about um, creating these siloed things while they're really good. This is about a networked approach um, so a community um, ends up functioning as a safe space for everyone. Thank you. Um, just uh, a tip here from, from someone saying that Russ Harris's book, The Happiness Trap, is a great starting point for ACT therapy if people are interested, um, may already have read that, but if not, that could be a nice resource for you to go to. Yeah, nice. Um, question here... Where do we draw the line if someone is experiencing psychosis? Don't they always need medication? Who would like to answer that? Well, I, I think that's... Um, I, look, I, I don't think Martina and I want, want to get into any kind of controversial... I think if there is a bit of a... It's a controversial area, and certainly um, in my experience, I, I, I've seen that... Um, People um, are able to, um, if if they if they if this sort of non-clinical compassion focused approach um, is taken, that um, it can reduce the distress, and the distress is often what's fueling that experience, and therefore some of the troubling and behaviour that can be associated with that experience. I'm someone that facilitates a hearing, hearing voices network group and I've seen um, the way in which that works in real life but there's only anecdotal evidence there and so I do appreciate that that it's very hard for people to not think that this needs a medical mm. um, approach and, and, and sort of cr a critical kind of in clinical intervention that that naturally in includes medication so but but I what I would encourage people to do is to, to find out a bit more about this for themselves, um, I'm not the expert, <laughs> and I don't. I, we don't claim to be. Oh, no. Thank you. There's a question here. Um, uh, re yeah, once again, people saying, please, any res resources you've got to please um, put them up, which we absolutely will. Any tips or ideas around working as a peer worker whilst also experiencing suicidal distress? Uh, I know that's something that um, Rose in the Ocean is working very hard on at the moment with the whole team that's developing the suicide prevention peer support services that we're developing, but love to hear your thoughts, um, Carrie and Martina, on that. I think, I mean, I'll, I'll let Carrie um, speak to this mostly, but again, I, I, you know, just um, firstly, just be curious and compassionate about what's going on for the person rather than, than trying to see it as, and, and again, it can be, I guess, scary for anyone who's um, having those experiences or even working alongside someone. But, uh, you know, again, it's coming from a place of humanity, what's going on for the person and trying to understand that. So, Harry, do you want to talk about what that might mean, though, for, for a peer worker? Yeah, so, sorry, was the question around whether the peer worker themselves was, was struggling with those Yes, as in, you know, how how can you how can you be working as a peer worker whilst you're also experiencing your own suicidal distress from time to time? Right. So it really well, talks about having peers with suicidal um, crisis or attempt experience, but being in that role at the same time. 
Yeah. Um, look, for me, I, I have um, uh, a background in peer work myself, and it didn't mean that, as we all know, recovery isn't a linear and progressive thing. It's um, and, and whether you call it recovery or, or whatever it is that you're that, that the arc of that from, um, you know, um, from when you, you know some people call it post-traumatic growth. That it's not that that there can be setbacks in that process, so that these things fluctuate. But I think the thing, the 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 strength in in being in a lived experience identified role is that you um, are kind of the, the the front is down, and so the the opportunity there is to be open about that. If you're in an organisation that supports that, to also for me, um, it's about being able to it's it, it's being able to continue to support yourself outside of the workplace, um, whatever that looks like for you. We all have different ways of doing self-care or support. I think it's super important to um, tap into to, uh, lived experience networks, to, to peer networks, because I've found that having um, my own peer support outside of formal peer work is what's kept me well or allowed me to be open about any struggles I have. But certainly that, you know, recovery is an individual process. How you work through it is, it's, I don't think it's any different whether you're being a peer worker or, or you're just um, working that out day to day yourself. So, um, but I really encourage you to, to try and tap into to, to lived experience networks where you can speak openly about those, those struggles because they're just human struggles. Thank you. Uh, probably got time for two more questions. There's uh, one here. How do we persuade clinical services to adopt the language changes that are so stigmatising? Um, this person works in a prevention and recovery service where the clinicians mean really well, but clients are treated as if they are their diagnosis and the language used in clinical meetings is very disempowering. So how do people actually um, help to influence that, that shift in language? I, I would argue it, it's 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 um, partly what we've been doing here today, and it's just to start to have conversations about it, and really just you know from human to human, just talk through why why the language is a problem. Um, look, we we know in, in all cultures and all areas, we have what what I call the exclusivity of language, and a particular language will get used in certain settings, and so um, it's just about you know having those conversations um, with with teams who've used that language eons and, and talking through and you know and, and yeah explaining why the language is problematic and and I call that gently gently shifting the language as you go along culturally what we're trying to do is is move the language inch by inch as we can person by person yeah absolutely I think and it, it's seeing it as a learning opportunity it's a gentle education process and that we can learn from each other that it's a co-learning opportunity there's certainly insights that clinicians can bring and and to model that um you know the the shift from the, that us and them sort of power dynamics that we know are very destructive not just to um us as people with lived experience but really also doesn't serve anyone well in terms of wanting to improve support so it is a gentle education process sometimes we want to be truth tellers and sometimes that's um required of us but um also i think and to, to really just have compassion for the fact that that clinicians um are, are, you know really are doing the best they can as well and um we all have a lot to learn from each other yeah, lovely thanks carrie and that's actually a a really nice way to um, wrap up that q a time um, we've got one minute left so i'd just love to thank both of you, Martina and Carrie, thank you so much for this webinar. Um, the comments coming through, people have been finding it very thought provoking, which is wonderful. Um, hopefully sparking that curiosity that you speak of um, and very informative. So I hope everyone that's joined us today has, um, has got something out of it. Um, we'd love you to join us for our next event within our lived experience professional development program. So next month on the 22nd of September, Dr. Alex Haynes will be um, joining us for uh, a conversation where it's, it's focusing around the World Suicide Prevention Day theme, um, working together to prevent suicide. So that's the, the third year of that theme. Uh, and he will be really reflecting on the five years that he spent uh, developing and at the helm of the Illawarra Shoalhaven Suicide Prevention Collaborative uh, 
Um, he's recently stepped down from that role, but Al um, Alex will be talking about bringing lived experience people and health professionals together um, for discussions, for collaboration and for innovation. So I hope you can join us on that. Um, we will let you all know um, the finer details of that webinar very soon. And we'll also be back in touch to let you know when these, um, this presentation, the slides and the additional resources are available on our website. So please take care, everybody. Um, I hope you have a lovely remainder of the day and we shall see you soon. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.